Throughout your career, you've helped amplify the stories of others, but you yourself have such an interesting path. How did this journey from engineering to television to content creation come about? You know, uh, it's a really good question because I'm one of those people that always look at doors being open for me. I always take a step forward and say, why not try? See what happens. And I get bored quickly. So I'm always like, I need to do something. I need to try something different. I love being challenged. But going from engineering to television, like how does that even happen? But <laughs> when I applied for university, I applied for journalism and engineering. And mm. I had a conversation with my dad and he kind of said, well, where are you going to make a, a living? Where are you going to have a career that's instant? The minute you get a university, you're going to have a job. And that landed me in engineering. And uh, But there was still that noise in the back of my head saying, you know, I do love journalism. Um, so I went through it. And then during the day, I used to be an engineer. And during the night, I volunteered mm. at a local TV station. And there was this passion that was coming out of it. I had my first child. And that was the moment I said, you know what, I'm ready to open that door, take a step in and see what happens with my media career. And here I am. Well, you've always used your platform to hold space for others, particularly women and South Asian creatives. Who are the people in your own life who've done that for you? When it comes to the South Asian community, women are taught to become successful, but not too successful. Uh, women are taught to take care of your family. That's where the love is going to come for you. That's where your happiness is going to be. There's a difference between happiness and joy. And yeah. so, like you said, I use this pat platform to for women to find joy. Yeah. You get those moments of happiness for sure. But what is that joy for you? And so I always push that narrative to live your best life. You should make yourself a priority. So did anyone actually influence me that way? No, because I think it's the opposite. I think it was being in this community. I saw the gossiping. I saw, you mm. know, your daughter should be doing this, the aunties saying this, the you know, all of it. And uh, you know, the darkness over you, if you don't do this, and this is what you're, and I think I took that, turned it into a positive and say, listen, women, yeah. you are a priority. And that's my generation of that change. Because my mom was like, work yourself hard as you can, have a family, do this, this, these, these are the rules. And I kind of changed that rules for my daughters and say, live your fullest life, work hard, and you will get that joy. And you will feel that happiness. Beautifully said. That also perfect like with this next question, but I feel like representation is such a cornerstone of media mm -hmm. and you've been such a trailblazer for your community. Have you had time to reflect on the contributions and knowing that you are now paving a way for people and that they might be inspired by what you've done? Yeah. So Kev, it was really interesting when I first started the career in media. I saw myself as a woman just being in television, giving it a try. I never looked at the aspect of actually being South Asian when I first started. Mm. And then there was this thing called DMs on Instagram. I had no idea what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Let's press on that button. And it was bombarded with incredible South Asian women saying thank you and leading away. And I didn't know how to absorb that. And so I took that as one of my identities that I'm able to have a voice for people who don't. And so what am I going to do with that? And like you said, I took the social media platform and changed it. I never used to talk about my, my culture. I never used to dress in Indian clothes. I never used to do that. And I'm like, it's time to embrace it. If this is what I'm getting in my DMS, this is what mm. I'm going to show. And, and not only for my, I think it's a lost, uh, I guess, format of how we celebrate cultures, right? Like my, my kids don't know very much about it. And I'm like, I need them to embrace it as well. So I show it to them little by little. So yeah, it took me a while to learn what it meant to be a person of color on a national platform on an entertainment show. I think I'm the first South Asian woman in Canada to host an entertainment show, which says a lot. And I, I should own that. And that took me a while to understand how to do that. And I think so often with social media, it feels like a highlight reel. And something else that I've appreciated about you is that you've always brought such a realness to your platform. Mm -hmm. where you are talking about the ups and downs of this industry, your own health struggles, but always told through that joy, like you were saying, which the world needs more of. Have you always known you wanted to use your platform and reach for this purpose? I think it was that time when I realized I did have a voice. I, I think mm. that's when I realized people are actually listening to what I have to say. And there was so much bad out there. There's so much bad news out there. We're bombarded with information. So I said, 
why not you come to my page to feel some of that joy, but at the same time, understand that you have value. So I started something called Fitness Tuesday for 10 years now. You know, it's a hashtag I started and I was showing women, especially South Asian women, old women of color in general, that it's okay to find something that makes you feel good physically, mentally, and emotionally. So I, I pushed that journey every Tuesday. I'm posting fitness and making, you know, having fun with it. It could be challenges. It could be actual workouts, yeah. but you know, the fact just getting your body moving and trying to show people that it's okay to be consistent and giving yourself an hour every day to go do something like that, where you're taking care of your temple because no one else is going to take care of it. And from that, I, I have no makeup on. I am talking to the camera. I am talking about my family. And, and I think I realized that people do come to my page for joy a few years ago during COVID. Yeah. That's when I really realized it. Uh, I mean, do I talk about serious, uh, uh, I guess I do. I do talk about serious issues out there, but I don't focus so much on that. I find yeah. serious issues, but also bring funness out of it. I talked about women having issues after having birth, but I put it in a comedic angle. So I try to create yeah. conversations that are easier for people uh, than going hard news, right? But that joy is such a gateway to having those conversations yeah. with your platform. And I think on top of all the different projects that you're working on, you're also a mother. How do you find that work-life balance? I feel like that's like something everybody struggles with. What's the secret <laughs> to that? Yeah, so I don't think there's ever a balance. Um, there are times and you will focus more on your career. And sometimes that takes a dip into your family life. And sometimes it's a family and you take a dip into your career. I don't think I've ever been balanced and that's okay. Uh, I know yeah. when my kids really need me or I know I can go on a trip for work and I know my husband's good. My husband's incredible. He's such an incredible dad. And because I have that, I'm able to play that game uh, and have a career. Uh, and I do miss out on some moments and you feel that guilt, but then you have FaceTime, you can sing to your kids, you can connect. Um, but that balance is just making sure they're happy. I think that's the yeah. identification for me that if something is working is knowing that they're taking care of and they're happy. Sometimes I'm not being on the road. I used to be on the road a lot and I miss them a lot, but I knew, you know, it's going to pass and there's going to be that moment where I'm going to be with them and work is going to have to hold off for a bit. Such a real answer. And, you know, one of the projects that you're working on is Love and Translation. It's so rare these days that we're able to see these fresh ideas and mm -hmm. such a unique social experiment. <laughs> what was your initial reaction when they pitched this to you? And having been a part of this series, has it made you look back at to what you and your husband connected with when you first met? So the reason I really enjoyed the concept was because I used to be an engineer. So yeah. when, the idea <laughs> of doing an experiment and seeing if it succeeds is just like, yeah, I would love to do this. And so when they told me about the social experiment, I was like, does this really work? And then you think about it, 90% of our communication is nonverbal every day. You talk through your eyes, your tone, you talk with touch, whatever it is, um, you're sending a message. So I wanted to see if this can actually work. And so that's what was the fascination for me. So I was really excited to be part of a project like this. And and I just got to say, it was kind of successful. And we'll find out in the final episode. But I was very excited about the final result. You've also built such an illustrious tenure hosting ET Canada and Home to Win. How have those experiences prepared you for this series? Yeah, so this is completely different. This, you know, when you do an entertainment show, you probably know, <laughs> Kev, like you're, you're reading a prompter. Or you know you're you you you're set. You know what you have to do. In this case, was being on set outside in Dominican Republic with hundreds of cameras. They're capturing every little moment, and I'm living through those experiments. I'm actually standing on the sideline watching mm -hmm. this action unfold, which is so cool. Because there was one of them where they do the eye gazing, and they have to sit there for two minutes, and they have to look in, into each other's eyes. And one of them, they started crying because I think there was this real connection and they were talking through their, their lenses of their eyes. And some, you know, one girl from Japan, culturally, yeah. it's disrespectful to look into someone's eyes like that. Then we learned a whole thing about that. And how does she change her way to make sure she can communicate with these American guys? 
So yeah, it it's, it was really cool. I think what's so surprising about this series, it does really highlight how there's so many different ways for us to communicate outside of words. And you have such a unique perspective as the host getting to watch this all happen. What was the yeah. most surprising part about this experience for you? How we adjust. I think when I saw the guys who didn't have the translators, the girls mm. had it. I had it. I was able to communicate with the girls, but the guys weren't able to. And it is really funny and really exciting to watch the way they try to communicate. There were times when they would use a word and just elongate the word. I'm like, it's the same word. They're not going to get it. Right. <laughs> like, why do we do that? Why do we slow down our language? You know, so um, and they would dance. They would, you know, they were trying so many different ways to communicate. And they sometimes thought they were getting the message through because of the way the person's tone was. And there was one mm. moment in the show which they got completely wrong. You know, she was playing a game and they thought she was being serious when she wasn't. It was just the way her tone is. And that's the person she is. And she didn't understand what was going on. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's I was learning a lot being there, you know, and every day I learned something different about how this actually, and of course you're talking about love, but also the idea of how you fall in love. Yeah. You also got to experience that in the, the first episode when you're explaining the concept behind the series before the girls got mic'd up, which was, that's <laughs> my nightmare, but <laughs> <laughs> imagine also, imagine going on a show and knowing that you're coming for love but then you can't even talk to these people yeah. I, I would love to see the show the other way around where we invite a bunch of guys to meet a bunch of girls that would be really have cool to, yeah they definitely have to do a second season and you initially didn't tell your girls about this show and you were curious to see what questions they would ask when it started airing what have those conversations been like so I didn't let them watch the first few episodes because, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> it is juicy. Uh, but we did talk a lot about communication uh, because I tried some of the experiments with my husband and he's like, what are you doing? Like I looked into his eyes, go look into my eyes. And he's like, what are you doing? Um, but the kids are, you know, they, <laughs> we talk about the the aspect of how you communicate. So that was really interesting because I was like, you're turning your body to, uh, towards the door instead of me. You're being very rude to me. And they're like, come on, mom. I'm like, you know, it, it's really, it's been really funny. I just pick on them when we're at the house. But yeah, <laughs> they they don't tend to watch me on television, uh, really. Um, which I think makes me really humble because uh, it doesn't really matter to my family. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You've been such a trailblazer. Hey, you know, I got one final <laughs> question for you. But you've also been so open about embracing the unknown and the nerves that come with that what's next for you outside of this project and you've done so much already what's left on that bucket list to accomplish you know sometimes when when et canada ended it was very sad i was very you know upset with the idea and and hurt because i was doing something that i really loved and it was such a passion project for me but on the hindsight i realized this there's been so much in my brain that I want to take out and actually mm. build something for myself, take some risk, you know, doing a, an American show was my first time leaving the Canadian market. And that was a risk on my part. And now I'm like, there's so much more out there. There is the world, you know, I live in this little bubble in Canada, but I'm so excited to see what's out there and create new content and be part of other projects that are new to me. That's going to make my heart beat fast. And that's where I am right now. I'm in the middle of hustling and I'm in the middle wow. of, you know, some of these projects, you know, there are, there are moments in your life where some years it's about learning there are, you know, some years it's about actually working on that project. So I think I'm in that phase of creating and learning. And so let's see where this lands but I'm going to invest in it finally. So I think this is something I've always wanted to do. And with the show ending and with what I, with my health scare, I think now it's the time for me to say, let's do it. So that's where I am. So it's really exciting, but very scary. And um, I have a great support group. So I'm like, let's do this. 